a lot of a lot of firms they they maybe show their returns but not really like they're showing the wrong data to maybe uninformed investors or potential like LPs of what the actual yeah. returns are and it's like they're they're showing oh look at our returns and like well well how are you marking the your current investments like all these other things that are just completely non-transparent what most people don't realize is a VC is a two-sided marketplace. They're at direct odds with one another. If a VC tells you how good their returns are, like what are they saying? <laughs> what are they saying to you as an entrepreneur? They got in. They got into low value and uh, <laughs> money they made off of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a really great pitch to an LP. But the better your return, like what was the most founder friendly? What everyone wanted? Blah blah blah. Like phenomena of the last few years. The one that will like never get the same level of LP funding again. Mm -hmm because of how poorly it has performed. Why haven't more VCs, there's so many VCs I think of in my, head, my mind right now. It's like, what, what do you do? Why should anyone choose you? If I'm a great entrepreneur, yeah. why should I choose your fund over another? There's zero differentiate, you're just dollars. And there's no differentiation. So I'm super excited to have Brian Casey with me today on the Entrepreneurial Excellence Podcast. And, and one of the reasons why I want to have Brian is he's one of the most fascinating people who people don't know about, actually. He, he has more data about what successful startups are, successful venture capitalists, and frankly, the whole entire sort of entrepreneurial ecosystem, at least the tech entrepreneurial ecosystem, exists than, than almost anyone I know. And very few people in the world know about him or the fact that he has that data. And so to get him on a podcast is a huge deal because he really doesn't do very much public at all. So Brian, thank you for being here. And before we even jump into things, I'll give you a quick background for folks on you. So you went to William & Mary undergrad, and then yeah. you went straight to Stanford Law School, or it looks like pretty much straight to Stanford Not Law School. I just didn't put some of that stuff on my LinkedIn. Okay, yeah. so there, we'll have to talk about that a little bit too, but ended up <laughs> at Stanford Law. And then while at Stanford did presumably pretty well because ended up becoming a lecturer at Stanford Law, which I assume is relatively rare for someone straight finishing Stanford Law, uh, and then decide not to go into law at all and start a company called Harmonic, which is gathering all this data. We're going to talk about that a ton. And then, of course, recently, about 10 months ago, started a company called Plural, which I am a full disclosure, an advisor, an investor in as well, and, and have the pleasure of seeing what Brian's building with this. So, Brian, <laughs> welcome. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no, it's as, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm excited because you have so much stuff that you know in your head and that you haven't shared. So I'm excited to try to draw some of that out today. So as we talk about, like one of the ways I like to start is like, tell us a little bit more about your background, right? So you, you went to William and Mary. Okay, great. You did something in between, between Stanford. What, what were the, what were those things drew you to decide to go to law school? Yeah. Yeah. So had a very weird and winding route into the technology industry. So grew up in a family that was very anti-capitalist. Really? I would, my mom is like almost hit the ass. She's a doctor, but I just kind of grew up very skeptical of anything in the private sector. Didn't have a cell phone till I was in high school. Didn't have a smartphone till college. I mean, that's actually probably very smart of your parents. They were way ahead of their time then. Cause I would, I, I have two young kids and I don't want them to ever have a, not ever, ever, but like don't want them to have a cell phone until like 15 or 16 years old. So your parents yeah. maybe were ahead of the, ahead of the curve. Yeah. Didn't, didn't love it as a kid, but I, uh, actually appreciate the fact that my brain had some different like dopamine wirings early on. But yeah, so pretty early on in my life. So I guess I was in high school, my family started having some pretty significant medical issues. And my mom and my sister ended up becoming permanently disabled from like the TLDR is like sick building syndrome. Basically, they were working out of a building that had like a mold and water damage and ended up having like really serious medical issues and not having any idea what was causing those medical issues for a really long time. So it just kept getting worse and kept going back into the buildings. So I ended up like not uh, wanting to go to college right after graduating high school. And I went to Scotland for a year and was a volunteer in a like care facility with the young adults with disabilities. So, wow. uh, and that was, and you think that was directly impacted by what your mom and your sister went through? I think so. Yeah. Disability has had like a really big through line in my life. Also responsible for sort of why I got into, uh, or interested in law. So, and eventually technology. So yeah, I think, oh, yeah. uh, okay, so that's why I love to ask these stories because it, 
there's sort of this story of what you what happens in early life tends to lead you in these different directions where you end up. But okay, yeah. so wait in in why Scotland by the way? Just this own personal curiosity because I actually spent a semester abroad in Scotland. But but there's lots of countries in the world. So why disability stuff in Scotland versus working at some disability place in the United States or? Yeah, so that one is because the Scottish medical system is a lot more robust in terms of the public funding and stuff than the U.S. one. So I was basically able to like work at this residential facility that had a lot of funding and probably wouldn't have been able to take like an 18 year old volunteer if they didn't have the funding. So there were just like cool opportunities there, I guess, in like retrospect. Again, it was just I was like looking for stuff uh, that was different from the u- usual university experience after graduating high school. And I was really attracted to it. That's super cool. And yeah. okay, so you did that for a year because I guess it sounds like because of what your mom and your sister went through, you're like, hey, I want to figure out the legal stuff because they were wronged legally, it sounds like, I would guess. Well, yeah, so the, I just I just didn't want to go to college after graduating and disability probably took like a front and center role into what I wanted to do next. Yeah. yeah. And then basically I went to school in my hometown. So I grew up in... Williamsburg, which is where William and Mary is located. And that was so that I could be close to family for medical stuff. And I kept going back to that community in Scotland. So I ended up living there for like three years total, going on and off between graduating. And then I went to, then I went to law school. And why, I mean, you know, so you want to say you, you went to college to be close to the family. And then of course you go overseas for, for doing the disability work and then decide to go across the entire United States to Stanford law the one of the bastions of probably capitalism and yeah. also all the way on the west coast that is a big decision why why make it yeah so at that point i was starting to get a lot more interested in technology and i went to stanford because i wanted to work on autonomous vehicles and like disability policy so there's like a weird intersection there as well but basically uber and Lyft and Waymo were starting to emerge around that time. These, these were really early days. This was like 2014, 2015. And they were starting to actually like hold the promise of autonomous fleets. And I had just constantly encountered how difficult it was to get transportation for the residents in this care home in Scotland. And so I wanted to basically work on certain acts of the civil rights laws from the 60s that cover like accessible transportation and basically like fuse autonomous vehicle technologies with these accessibility mandates in a way that meant like the technology would be disability forward from the beginning. Do you think that's happened? Just sort of a slight tangent there. Do you think that's happened now in that time, you know, in the past, you know, not quite 10 years yet, but almost 10 years since then, has that started to happen or do we still have a long way to go? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think autonomous vehicles are still on their way to adoption. Cruise is doing some interesting stuff and, and Waymo is as well. But basically the, the, the precursor to that is Uber and Lyft. So basically like the Uber and Lyft were also relatively novel at the time. And there were a bunch of emerging lawsuits around accessibility of the drivers. So you have this like new dynamic where taxi companies have some mandate to have a certain number of accessible vehicles in their fleets. But then Uber and Lyft were in this very much like we're totally independent contractor driven. So we can't have any like mandate of what vehicle you're driving kind of set up. And so there have been like huge advances in the ability for people with disabilities, I think, to get transportation. It's not perfect. Nothing is perfect. But like because of disability rights advocates on the forefront of those technologies, I think you just have a lot more accessibility options as someone with disabilities, particularly like in, in urban or like outside of urban environments. Yeah, which is which is obviously a great thing that people can get around because it's a, a key a key element to life is being able to go somewhere, do the things you need to do, and do it with a relative amount of convenience. So that's yeah. great that that stuff has improved. Yeah. Yeah, and that was a big turning point in my life where it became clear to me how technology was actually something that could be a force for good in the world. And that just trying to do this from an entity that had the incentive structure of a nonprofit or some of the other things that I was really attracted to when I was younger and really anti-corporate, it started to actually flip upside down. So then, okay, so now you're at Stanford. And, and, and once again, did you answer, why did you go west? Why, why all the way to Stanford? Why so far away from home? I mean, it's a great yeah. law school, but still, there's lots of great, there's a ama- ton of amazing law schools in the East Coast too. Yeah. 
the the like selfish answer is that I had been in Scotland for three years and never wanted to get rained on again. Uh, <laughs> That's a very good reason. <laughs> and I think the real reason is I knew that I wanted to work on autonomous vehicles at that time and East Coast schools just didn't really have any of that. Yeah. But still, so you want to work in autonomous vehicles and you go to law school. So what, that's not the usual path people would say when I want to work on autonomous vehicles. I want to be like, in, in saying like, well, I, I, I can't, I'm so excited to be the, the general counsel and do like political advocacy for this. It's not the yeah. usual. Most people don't take that path to the technology they want to work on. Yeah. But if you were a lunatic though, saying in fact, then uh, you had like a choice of one or two schools, which is Stanford or Berkeley. Fair. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Totally fair. So you go to Stanford. Uh, you do your thing there. What, what then made you, I guess this maybe you sort of answered the question to some extent. Why did you then not go into law? Like you ended up becoming a lecturer at Stanford, which once again, yeah. poses you did pretty well. If Stanford's like, please stick around and actually lecture the kids who are the, the folks who are only two or three years younger than you or below you really. And probably some of them might've been even older than you actually. Uh, what, what was that decision to not actually go into law and to stick yeah. around and then to start your company at the same time? Yeah. Yeah. So I thought I, I kind of went to law school thinking that I would do policy advocacy from like academic seat. So I had been doing research and publishing articles in law school. Uh, I thought I was going to try to go the like professor track. And so got super lucky and was able to teach at Stanford right after graduating and had like clerkships lined up and some of the like boxes that you check if you're trying to be an academic. And then I started tinkering with a side project that kind of took over my life, which then became harmonic. Uh, so how did tell, tell her how, why did you start tinkering with this idea that became harmonic? What was this even thinking there? Why was that one seen given all the background history you just told everybody? Why was that even a thing that you're like, I want to go build harmonic and, and maybe this is a good example. Why don't you describe har what is harmonic today? And then we'll jump back into like your early tinkering days. Yeah. Harmonic's like a, it's like a Google search for the startup ecosystem. So if you want to find every single company that has raised between 10 and $20 million and has a CTO that used to go to Stanford, it's actually like a really, really difficult search. And we kind of aggregate and then organize all of that data and make it really easy to search across and visualize. So. We sometimes refer to ourselves as like Bloomberg for the private markets. There just isn't enough data to really get to the level of resolution of a Bloomberg, but that's the general idea. So, okay. So then why does someone who is into self-driving cars, but disability at Stanford Law start tinkering in all of your available free time as like a 2L or 3L or something on building the Bloomberg for, for startups? <laughs> Yeah, well, so I went down the street and talked to Mike Maples at Plugate and a few other VC firms that did really early stage investing. And I just asked them how they, they found companies. And hold on, hold on. I want to pause there for a second too. Not many people, like you just say it so nonchalantly. I just, I just walked down the street and go talk to Mike Maples and, and really well-known VCs. How, do, how does that even occur? Or is it just that you have the kind of the chutzpah to just say, you know what, like I'm going to go knock on people's doors. I, by the way, I will add a lot of people in the world are afraid to ask questions. And yeah. so maybe you're not one of those people who just say, I'm just going to go ask and maybe they'll, they'll see me. Yeah. Well, I've gotten a bit more chutzpah over time, but I don't think this one was chutzpah driven. And I think one area where I did have chutzpah and still do is just not being satisfied with the answers that people give to the questions. So I knew the, the chief of staff of Floodgate, he was a student at Stanford at the time. And so that's how I ended up connecting with, with Mike and Basically, the answer was like, you know, we network and don't take any data driven approach to trying to figure out like what's going on. And so the, the way that it kind of connects back to the legal background is that I started looking at filings that you have to throw off in the process of starting a business that show up in public registries as a kind of treasure map for finding interesting emerging companies. Yeah. But not all those have to be registered right away, right? There, you maybe theoretically have to register them right away when that stuff happens, but companies don't always actually file it. They don't want that stuff showing up publicly. So the data is still dirty. Yeah. Well, yeah. D dirty or there are some things that are, that, that, that are invisible. So I describe it as like a precision and recall problem. Um, so there's like a, is it a, fa fa like a false positive 
is dirty. And then a false negative is not necessarily dirty, just incomplete. So it's like, did, did I, did I incorrectly identify this company as an interesting company or did I just like fail to find this company altogether? And so I didn't like incorrectly or correctly identify it. I, I just didn't find it. So those are two like different problems. It's possible to be imperfect on both, but yeah, it's really hard to get a completely comprehensive view of everything that's happening, but it is a lot more achievable to kind of, of the things that you are able to see surface some really interesting insights. And do you think that, so, so going back to what Mike said to you, was your mind kind of blown when he said like, you know, one of the best VCs out there and he's like, yep, yeah, like I get my deals because I network in friends, pass along deals and, and my name gets out there a little bit. Or were you just like, holy shit, like this is, this is the best, these, these famous venture capitalists who I think a lot of startup founders kind of look up to in a big way. Yeah. You know, like that's, that's the best you can do is you're, you're hoping the right deal lands on your plate because your friend introduces you to them. Like that seems very wave my hand in the air and, and, and hope I catch something. Yeah. Yeah. It was a really unsatisfying answer. I think it's in, in hindsight, it's like a slightly better answer than I gave it credit for at the time, because there are some elements to like founder Hutzpah that put you in like Mike's inbox that are actually like interesting signals. But generally, if your job is to find like pre-seed companies, your, your, your number one focus should well, your number one or number two focus should be on making sure that you're seeing as much as possible. You have to like see as much as you can and then have a good selection algorithm. But if you're not seeing as much as you can, then you're either doing like a fraction of the deals that you could be doing, or you're just having to like select the cream of the crop from a much smaller pool. And so you're never going to be as good as if you could just, uh, as if you could just increase the number of companies that you were seeing. So what, what percent then do you think of venture investors today are, are using Harmonic or I don't know if there's competitors, but, but tools like Harmonic to, to attempt to be a little bit more data-driven. Cause I, I will say, by the way, a lot of VCs I talk to, my impression is, and I have not asked them in case, you know, discuss this the way you have, but is that many of them still do it kind of the way we just described Mike doing it 10 years ago. It hasn't yeah. actually changed that much, but what percent, you know, at least whatever you can say publicly, what percent do you think are using Harmonic today or, or competitors? Yeah. It's hard. There are a lot, a lot, a lot of funds out there. That's great for your business, right? It, there's a really long tail of funds that are just really small. And so they can't afford any type of products. So I don't know if it's great for my business, except that, you know, if they're successful, then they raise bigger funds and invest more resources and in trying to do a better job. But in terms of like established funds, I would say that Harmonic's market penetration I, I, I don't have a great answer to this, but I would say maybe something like 30% of the industry. So it's like a good size number. I would say PitchBook, which is like a more established competitor that also kind of caters to later stage and private equity a bit more, has like 80, 85% penetration on established firms. But we describe PitchBook as like a FOMO tool, which is, uh, it's like, it's like a really great way to see all the deals that get announced that you missed out on sure. and had no idea existed, but sure. it doesn't give you tooling to actually figure out like what were the companies doing before they announced that raise that shows up on PitchBook. Or, or right. Expected. I mean, cause Harmonic, Harmonic, I mean, I've not used it, although it's a tool that I would love to start using at some point for, for my own company, but you can start setting like signals, right? If I want to see, Hey, anytime this company hires a CFO, that's probably a signal that they are moving into the next stage of their progress is maybe an example. Yeah. Right? And you guys can pull that signal, not even when they hire that person, but maybe even when they list that job. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So there are a ton of early indicators or leading indicators of the types of things that VCs want to know about. And so before Harmonic, the state of the art was like live feed of everything that has already passed you by. And Harmonic lets you kind of be the creator of your own leading signals. We try not to be too opinionated on what exactly are leading signals because then there isn't any alpha, but we just make it really easy to come up with your own because we structure the data and then make it really easy to filter. Okay, so so just speaking more about like the entrepreneurs that I want to talk more about, of course, the VCs and, and just overall entrepreneurs that you've looked at with all this data, but for your own drive with, with Harmonic, you only have 30% market penetration. Your competitor is essentially a FOMO tool. Yeah. Why, why, why don't you have 100% market penetration like why isn't every vc who's only your only job as a vc is to have 
better returns in minimum than the S and P five hundred, but hopefully a lot better than that. Very yeah. to achieve it. Yeah. There's a tool out there that can help you get ahead of the curve and get yeah. in, know at least know the best deals are, are happening, which means you can at least put your name in the ring with that yeah. founder. What like why isn't everybody using you? Why haven't you achieved hundred percent market penetration? Yeah. Yeah, we haven't been around that long. You know, almost in, almost five years, right? Thanks to us. Well, yeah. I mean, I think we're we're like an actual thing that's worth I was in the wilderness for a while, so I have like personally been working on it for five years, but we didn't actually start work like doing anything significant until I guess like right before COVID. And then the VC world went through a massive transition during COVID where they had to take Zoom calls instead of just going to like networking events in person. So San Francisco stopped being the center of gravity and people actually expanded their aperture like uh, US wide. And so that was a really big like dynamic change for us. And, but, they're, but there's still a really long way to go. VCs are a really weird customer. They have super long feedback loops of like what works and what doesn't work. And then it's, it takes, it also takes a really long time for them to figure out like what competitors are doing to kick their ass. Whereas in a like faster paced financial asset management sector, you just, you just learn that way quicker. So if you're. If you're in a hedge fund and you're not adopting the like latest, the, the state of the art, like software and, and techniques that you discovered a lot quicker than VC, which might take you 10 years. That's, I mean, I, I so I, I hear you on that because it takes so long for venture returns to reach fruition, which is actually part of obviously plural. And we can talk about that. We definitely should talk about that too. But, but even then, if I'm a good VC yeah, and I recognize that it takes 10 years to actually get my own data set to see if it works. You guys also have, at Harmonic, you have data from what the past 50, 40 years since VC has been a thing. You already have all that data. So I don't need to actually wait for my own returns to figure out what works. Can I look back at all the other data that you already have and say, what what is actually working with others? Like, why do I need to wait 10 years? Like, that seems idiotic for me to wait. And there's one thing that bothered me about VC in general. It's like, wait, I, I'm gonna invest in you as a, a fund manager. And I actually won't know for 10 years if you're any good at this. And by that point, yeah. like, you probably hit me up three more times to put, put money into your next funds. And there's yeah. no evidence that you're actually good at your job. It's yeah. idiotic. <laughs> I think that is starting to change a little bit, but I agree. It's idiotic and you actually don't know whether they're good at their job if they return really well. You need a really, really long period of deployment and you need a lot of like bets taken before you start getting beyond a regression toward the mean problem. Isn't- isn't there also though some data that shows that that most fund managers their their success goes down over time? So like they maybe are really good in the beginning because they have like a really strong network and because they're like really deep in it. And the next you know they have families and they move to the suburbs and like who knows what all the reasons are. But like you lose some of that like can maybe that networking that was really important in that early yeah. network that made you great at what you do. And so by the time you're raising these big funds off of your previous successes, you're you're actually have your abilities have gone down, like not maybe not abilities, but like some, what does that data look like for that? I mean, or, or should everyone just invest in early invest in someone's first fund and never invest in any of their secondary and third, fourth funds? Yeah, no, I think so. If you look at other asset classes, venture is the only one that doesn't have a regression toward the mean problem. Meaning can you, can you define the, yeah, define that for everybody. Yeah. Well, so if you roll, if you, if, if you're looking at stuff from a completely random perspective, there are going to be some people that for like zero skill at all have a really good uh, first funds. But then if you like roll the dice enough time or like have enough attempts at trying to act on the skill based activity that you actually start to get like statistical scale <laughs> numbers of attempts, then what people find evidence for is that there's actually some mean level of performance and things that are outliers in either direction at the beginning will regress, meaning like a uh, like, uh, shift toward the average given enough times to do the like skill-based activity. So the, the insight is like, it's hard to tell skill from luck with r- like really few cracks at bat. And, and so why is, so you said the VC is the one that doesn't regress towards the mean or just it takes so long that by the time you have data, it's almost irrelevant. Well, so VC, people have studied this for like hedge fund managers and PE and all kinds of stuff. And 
the the findings are that sort of outsized performance at the beginning is not an indicator of like future outsized performance. They actually probably got like luckier than they were this incredibly skillful investor. There are of course exceptions, but the like the literature indicates that basically what looks like skill at the beginning actually turns out to have not been that much skill. And there's some like mean level of performance that you can expect over a long enough time horizon. VC defies that. And there are a bunch of, there are a bunch of speculations why the best ones I've heard are that because it's so, because it's so deal flow driven, you build a brand. And so if you're Sequoia, you actually are seeing, if you think of like, what percentage of great opportunities Sequoia sees because the best founders want to pitch Sequoia, you get this positive feedback loop where if you are known as an incredible investor, then you get better deal flow. And so you can select from a better crop of like potential startups than your peers. And so you actually don't regress toward the mean. And so VC is one of these few asset classes where past performance is actually more indicative of future performance. I'm sure there's all kinds of like, you know, resting on your laurels or but all the phenomena that you were describing as well. But it is interesting that it actually doesn't regress like the other asset classes. That actually, that is fascinating. It, though The way you describe it makes total sense because it, it becomes, essentially it's a positive feedback loop, right? Where the better deals you have in the beginning. Now, I, I think the big difference though, and this is something that I've, I've also been shocked, I don't see more VCs doing, is the only way for that positive feedback loop to work is you have to tell the world about your pure yeah. positive wins. And, so, so how many VCs, like, is that what separates a good VC and a bad VC? Is like, you might have a lot of really good early wins, but the world yeah. doesn't know about it. So you don't get that positive feedback loop. So you're sort of starting from fresh every day. Like, so few yeah. VCs are actually good at marketing themselves. Like Sequoia just has like this gold plated name and that's just the way it is. But Andreessen and to their credit has been really good at marketing and actually yeah. really invested in it. And then a few other, you know, firms, I think have been pretty good about their marketing, but many yeah. others are, are, you don't even know who they are. Yeah. Yeah. I don't fully understand what explains this phenomenon of just there being a culture about zero transparency on how good of a VC you actually are. And even the ones that are like more vocal about it, I don't know, they'll like, they'll like show a picture of how they were in the same room as this founder after the company IPOs or something, but you don't actually know what their entry price was or what their return profile was. And it can be really misleading. So it, it, my, my best explanation for like why people aren't more vocal about it actually has to do with regulation, which is until Obama passed the Jobs Act, there wasn't this 506C exception, which you might be familiar with, where you're actually allowed to solicit or like market your product or your fund, I guess. <laughs> I think of it as a product. You just, you had to be really, really hush hush about how you were describing your fund performance because there was this there was this potential that you were basically like soliciting or advertising a financial product that hadn't been registered with the SEC. And up until pretty recently, there weren't a lot of ways around that. Now, if you basically check to make sure all of your investors are accredited, you have, you have the ability to actually be proactive, like talking about your fund and marketing it. But I, I wonder if it's just a relic of uh, a weird state of regulation. I don't think that, that fully explains it though, because I've also gone down the rabbit hole of using public record requests to pull pension and endowment data because the pensions and endowments fund all of the big boys and some of them are like regulated under Freedom of Information Act stuff or the state level equivalent. And so you can request their fund returns and you can actually get really, really granular data on like how these pensions that invest in the sequoias and the benchmarks of the world have done in these different vintages of the funds and California actually in, I believe in 2001. So like post.com bubble, there was a lot of outrage about, you know, endowments or pensions, mismanaging capital by putting it in a venture because venture started like really underperforming and sort of having a similar moment right now. And California passed a bunch of transparency laws and like Sequoia pulled out of letting California companies really just to hide its returns. And it was the spat between it and Kleiner at the time. Kleiner was more of a dominant force back then. So they didn't want Kleiner to know their returns and Kleiner didn't want them to know their returns. And it was this, but it's silly. If, if you're not showing your returns, like what's going on? Don't a lot of, I mean, this is something that I, I've heard some other people talk on the topic. Like a lot of a lot of firms, they, they maybe show their returns, but not really. Like they're showing the wrong data 
to maybe uninformed investors or potential like LPs of what the actual yeah. returns are. And it's like, they're, they're showing, oh, look at our returns. And like, well, well, how are you marking the, your current investments? Like all these other things that are just completely non-transparent. Yeah. Yeah. And there are all these, yeah, exactly. And the reason they can do this is because there are like exemptions that allow sophisticated investors to invest in them. But if you think of who the sophisticated investors are, they're people at like the, the people putting a hundred million dollar checks into Sequoia are like cancer research nonprofits and like pensions <laughs> of different government organizations. And so all these like protections in place to protect retail you're actually putting a bunch of retail money into these funds and transparency matters. So, so why hasn't this game changed more? I mean, so going back to like even the marketing of it, okay, fine. Laws have changed now. They can market it. Yet I still haven't seen a lot of, to your point about maybe there's more going on. I haven't seen a lot of VCs really up their marketing game, right? I think once again, like Andrew Eason was the one who I really think put a real push behind this. And to some extent it worked, obviously parts of it didn't work, but why haven't more VCs? There's so many VCs I'm thinking of in my head, in my mind right now. It's like, what what do you do? Why should anyone choose you? If I'm a great entrepreneur, yeah. Why should I choose your fund over another? There's zero differentiate. You're just dollars. And there's no differentiation. Right. Why why hasn't that happened more with, with VCs? If you can speculate or just so as an entrepreneur choosing who to who yeah, like well, well that's part of I mean that's part of it right so. As an entrepreneur, I want to choose the best fund because it makes my company look better. It's better for my recruiting, all these other things. So yeah, ergo, it should make more sense for a venture fund to want to make their name really strong and really positive and be out there as something like, so that me as a founder of a company, like, I'm so proud of the fact that I have these amazing backers backing me. You then recruit yeah. enough people and then it becomes its own self-fulfilling prophecy, right? You can recruit better people because of the, the investors you have they can maybe get you in front of if you're doing enterprise, big enterprise sales, they can get you in front of really big companies. These, yeah. th these things start building upon themselves. Yeah. Well, so a VC is a two, what most people don't realize is a VC is a two-sided marketplace and they're at direct odds with one another. So if a VC tells you how good their returns are, like, what are they saying? <laughs> What are they saying to you as an entrepreneur? They got in. They got into low value and <laughs> money they made off of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a really great pitch to an LP. Um, but the better your return, like, what was the most founder friendly? What everyone wanted? Blah blah blah. Like phenomena of the last few years. Uh, the one that will like never get the same level of LP funding uh, again because of how poorly it has performed in like a post surf environment. So Tiger was like the gold standard of founder friendly and it's probably self bank too. And their whole motto is like no governance, like good valuations. We're just a commodity or going to underwrite you. And honestly, like, I think that that's, I don't actually think there's anything wrong with that model. And I think they timed it really poorly, but it could definitely work, but you're, you're at complete odds. So it's become this like weird prestige university thing where like we have a really low acceptance rate. So that's how VCs kind of spin it into uh, take our money because you're saying you got into Harvard or something yeah. because the acceptance rate of Harvard's four percent. So then like the signaling value that we can add to you is worth this like huge haircut. But in general, like if you're trying to show your LPs that you get really good returns, you're, you're showing them how unfounder friendly you are and vice versa. Although, when, when did the VC say, we're not founder unfriendly, these great returns are because, yeah, we got in at a good valuation, but we helped them, we helped the founder reach this great exit point. And that's, that's where we, we really added value. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that it was much, VC looked a lot different back in the day. It was really risk capital. The like insights of YC hadn't been industrialized and made like widely available to pretty much any founder. But at this point, like, I, this is just one person's opinion, but how much a VC can change the tra trajectory of your company is just drastically reduced relative to what it was 20 years ago or 30 years ago when an entrepreneur would basically have like no other good access to capital and genuinely lack the like understanding that's been democratized now of how startups should work and scale. So does that mean, so actually then, does that lead to the, the inevitable conclusion, maybe, maybe, I guess maybe not inevitable. So tell me if it is that as an entrepreneur, you shouldn't care at all who you take money from. Just, just take money at the best valuation you can get with someone. Hopefully you get along with, of course, because they're probably going to be on your board and it, 
it doesn't really matter? I don't know. Yeah, well, I don't, I wouldn't necessarily phrase it that way, but I would say people should be much more inclined to separate capital from all of the other like accoutrements <laughs> that a VC offers. And if there's some incredible VC that you want with you along for the journey, like put them on your board, give them a small equity stake, and then get the capital from somewhere that doesn't cost 10% of your company for that equity stake or for that, for that involvement. So I, I think the unbundling of capital from all of the other things that VCs are supposed to do would potentially be really good. I don't know if there are like second order effects that I haven't thought through, but, and then, and then it's not to say that there aren't amazing people that can change the trajectory of your company that you should try to get as incentive aligned as possible. Just forcing it through the mechanism of shoving like $20 million into a company yeah. doesn't necessarily have to be it. Uh, you can just bring them on as advisors. Like bring them on as advisors or hire them as an employee and bring them on as a teammate. Forget the VC part. Like I'd rather exactly. spend two to 3% of my equity on the most ridiculous, best senior person I could have who literally will change my company and work full time on it. Than exactly. And that's, that partner is going to get so they're, they're actual, if they put $20 million into you for 10% of your company, blah, blah, blah. Like the math on like how much of the fund they own after they're managing directors and blah, blah, blah. And then like how they're going to get a distributed a distribution from your company that's like related to carry, but it's not on a deal by deal basis. So it's not directly correlated with your companies. Like it's really diluted versus just giving them an equity stake and calling it a day and you give up way less of your company and then you can go get capital at the best price. So then I have to ask what, is, since you brought up YC, how, how does, what, what would be your advice to founders about YC or accelerators like it, right? That take 7% plus for frankly, a low amount of cash. You get this YC network, you get the, you know, it's sort of like you're, you're getting the best, you're getting the best startup degree possible, you know, it's yeah. sort of gold plating startup degree, but as someone who also went to Stanford, a great, also a gold plated sort of degree, what advice would you give people about that? Like, should you give up that 7% if you can get in or? Yeah, I think it's really case by case. I think people have really strong opinions in, in both directions. It is not at all a hard no. Whereas I think some people are like, you should never give up this much for this small amount of capital in this environment. Like YC is really an example of that advisor thing that I was talking about. Like the capital is irrelevant. They do this like $500,000 thing now, which actually turns it into a more meaningful amount of capital. And in this type of funding environment, there are actually like advantages to that as well. But, but yeah, I would basically just like totally separate the money from it and just be like, does joining this network increase the value of my company by more than I'm giving up? And there are a lot of circumstances where I think the answer to that's yes. There are also a lot where it's no, but particularly if where I've seen YC companies make that trade off really successfully is like a rippling that joins YC, even though he's like a second time, super successful founder, and then immediately has like a massive network of potential customers to sell into. So if you're a B2B company, and not just a B2B company, but your kind of ICP, ideal customer profile looks like the type of company that comes out of Y Combinator, it's so value-add. Did, did Parker get the better deal from YC? I feel like because he was such a successful second-time founder, like he's one of those, like he's good marketing value for, for yeah. YC too. I, I do wonder, I don't know if it's been public or not. It doesn't happen, but a lot of things allegedly don't happen at YC that then like come out in email so who knows uh, yeah that's yeah. i don't i don't know if i fully buy it but i guess what i what i would say is even if you didn't get a sweet deal it could it would still like if i were him in his shoes i would still do it it is like hard to think of something more valuable than being that having that whole ecosystem really really care about your success if you are the type of person that sells into that ecosystem yeah totally fair so i want to i actually want to start talking about entrepreneurs for a bit too but before we get off the the vc topic leads for for a little bit are there, are there any other key things like when you're thinking through as an entrepreneur, but also maybe as an LP, like you've looked at all this data in more depth and actually maybe this is a good segue really briefly into plural, right? So the idea of plural, well, actually I can give it, but why don't you explain plural and what you're doing there in some of the data you looked at to make decisions around how plural would work, why it would work, including even looking at, I don't know if you've ever made this public, but like, I don't think you have, but you should, but like the data around like, who are the, who are the really top VCs? Like who are the real yeah. top venture firms versus what I might just put down on a list of the top 10 if I were just making it up off the top of my head or Googling. Yeah. It. Yeah. Yeah. So what is plural? Plural is a 
venture fund, I guess is like <laughs> one way to describe it. So you basically find people that have really concentrated equity positions and you invite them to invest in your fund. And the trick is they're not investing with cash, like a normal LP in a fund, they're investing with shares. And so effectively the fund is like getting exposure to companies that the investors are putting in. And if you do that with an interesting group of companies, then you end up with what looks like a fully deployed venture fund, meaning all the cash in a venture fund eventually gets spent on shares and you are left with a basket that you hope is interesting and appreciates. And you can basically just bootstrap that without raising a fund. If you find people who are holding the shares that you want and convince them that they should like invest in your fund <laughs> with shares instead of cash. So why, why do that? What was the problem that was being solved, right? Because if, if I'm an investor in, in yeah. you can use myself, right? Because I am. So I, I hold these concentrated positions. Those yeah. concentrated positions are actually the reason why my fund might turn out really good is because like they're, they're finally, like, they're 10 years in, they're hopefully yeah. gonna public soon. I'm going to get this yeah. great return. Why yeah. dilute, dilute the thing that's going to make, make or break my fund by giving some percentage of that investment over to plural? Yeah. Yeah. So the data on backing up the truck on your winners and letting your winners ride is actually like really rough. So usually you should just stick with your position. <laughs> if you got into a winner, if you then start backing up the truck on it, everyone else has noticed that it's a winner as well. And so the cost of capital of getting in there is actually pretty steep. And so what Plural does is it finds people that don't want to continue investing in that winter, in that winter, but have had a 10x, 20x, 30x, 40x, 100x. And so they're usually by that point outside of their zone of expertise, meaning if you're an angel or seed stage investor, by the time a company is like series C or series D, you don't like, you're no longer able to understand what differentiates that company. You're now in the zone of like growth investors and they will like kill you <laughs> if you were competing there. Most people recognize that, but because they don't have any tools to actually like manage out of positions at that stage, that's no longer in their zone of expertise. They kind of just sit on their hands until the company IPOs. That's a strategy that works sometimes. Uh, it's a strategy that does not work other times. And what Plural does is it finds people with those really concentrated positions that have already appreciated a lot and it helps them start shaving some of the risk off, not all of the risk off generally, but some. And if I recall, there, there's some data around the value of actually selling down, right? Some of the best VC firms will sell down their shares over time when they have the opportunity to do so because they've actually run the data and it actually shows that it's worthwhile to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure whether it was a chicken and egg, or egg thing where they ran the data or uh, they just had this conviction and they've since turned out to be really high performing funds. but. Um, yeah, so uh, I've pulled a lot of data on fund performance. Uh, I won't say anything like super definitive here, uh, but Union Square Ventures does this systematically. They're very public about this. Even on the ones that they're uh, really high conviction on, they don't take the position of backing up the truck. They take the position of <laughs> driving the truck away or <laughs> whatever you would call it. And so you can see these S1 filings of Coinbase that went public and these others that they invested in early. and they did all of these transactions to basically liquidate some of the position along the way. About 30% is what I understand um, until the company IPOs. And they've been incredibly successful with that strategy. Um, they are one of the best performing VC funds I have ever seen. So th this idea of kind of playing in your zone of expertise and then managing out of risk, I think is something that needs to be a long more front and center adventure. Uh, if you think about every other asset class, you have to time the entry of your position. And then you also have to be cognizant of the exit of your position. And venture is the like only one out there that just white knuckles it until some kind of exit that they have no control over. And I think it's because of transfer restrictions and all kinds of stuff that like, I think it's a huge pain in the ass for USV to go and tell Brian Armstrong that they're like selling a bunch of his position, even though they still have an enormous amount of confidence and are on the board, blah, 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 because it has like some weird signaling stuff. But if that were more normalized, as just like a part of life. Like Warren Buffett still like sells some of his positions in companies and it doesn't mean they, they don't have conviction in them anymore. This is like a very common practice. If it were, if it were a bit more mainstream, I think it would be viewed as absolutely negligent <laughs> to your LPs and the return profiles to not do it. Well, isn't it also hard for, for at least maybe, maybe Union Square can do that, but me as more of an angel investor, 
it's very, I don't get offers from the CEOs. I don't have a large enough position that the CEO is like, Hey, look, we're selling. Do you want to sell some of your shares? Like that is so rare. So I don't even have a choice to either stay in or get out. I, I literally have to wait till it goes public or gets acquired. Yeah. Yeah. So plural does two things that I think are really helpful in this regard. One is it doesn't actually set the price. It just comes up with a fair way of retroactively understanding the price once an exit actually happens. And then you can literally like play around with scenarios and see whether it makes sense for you. So it's like a very high transparency process. You don't have to be like right space, right time, right invite of this like secondary opportunity. And then if you see that secondary opportunity, your first instinct is like, well, why is someone like buying at this price? Is there something I don't know? Should I keep holding? It's just a really like weird info asymmetry game that we try to solve by just completely scrapping the idea of trying to price the asset at the exact moment. And then the second piece is that a lot of these things can be like caught up in a rat's nest of like SPVs and fund interests and like this position and this thing and this one goes to this thing. And I have a carry position that I could sell. But if I did like an actual transaction, it would be like a GP led secondary. And it's a, it's a, it's a nightmare to actually logistically do this stuff. And the second component that plural does is it just really simplifies the logistics around different instruments that people use to even get liquidity if they have an opportunity. Yeah, no, that's, and that's part of why, obviously, I was so excited about it because I do believe in diversification. I believe I would love to be able to sell. It's actually something I've tried to train myself as a public, just stock market purchaser, selling, selling stuff when I, it's really hard. It's, I've actually, I think I'm, I think I'm pretty good at buying the right time, <laughs> but I'm, I'm really bad at selling at the right time. And yeah. getting good at that is sort of the next part of my own, frankly, investor journey is knowing when to sell, or at least in, in at least when it comes to a lot of the private investments I made, when you guys came along with this vehicle saying, Hey, like this is a way to essentially exit some of your positions. Do you risk those positions? Yeah. I'm maybe giving, potentially giving up some upside, but I'm also capping my downside and buying a basket of other top tier investments that seemed like a no brainer. And sure, I'm paying you a little bit for that privilege, but yeah. So be it. I mean, that's a, that's a worthwhile trade-off. Yeah, exactly. The mental model that sometimes really clicks with people is, let's say you did a million dollar check in a company that has 50x in value. So you now have 50, 50 million dollars in the company. And if I came to you and basically said, I will give you $50 for those shares, would you put every single dollar back in that company at that, at that price, at that 50x appreciated price? Because that's sort of what you're doing every day that you don't take any risk off. You're, you're saying, you're communicating that. And Wait, so, sorry, let me, let me, you're, you're essentially communicating by not taking any risk off. You're essentially continuing to reinvest. You're taking the, someone walked up to you and gave you 50 million bucks. And then you were like, I'm going to put that 50 million right back into that company yeah. at this, at that price, not my original interest price, at that new price. And so when you put it in those terms, people are like, Okay, $50 million is a lot of concentration to have in this single company. Would I not take some of it and put it in other directions? The, the asset has already appreciated 50, 50x. It's in a completely different like growth zone than my area of expertise. Do I even know what the fuck I'm doing here? And the third thing is, I know that I am like really good at compounding wealth at this early stage that's in my zone of expertise. If that money were liquid... Is it, if I put my, if I clock my own IRR at 25% or 30%, is this company going to continue growing at 25 or 30%? Or should I basically start taking like liquid capital out of it and deploying it in my zone of expertise so I can start those compounds on that like 50X journey? Well, and, that, and that's where that's the unit, unit square example is really good, right? Which is, you know, maybe they sold Coinbase at a lower valuation than what it was when it became public, but they yeah. sold it time wise. At an earlier stage, the IRR, and that's pretty good because they redeploy that cash into other much higher value investments. So, you know, you might look right. at a sheet like, oh, well, they sold it. I'm just going to make up the numbers. Like they sold it $10 in shares and it went public at 20. But like, yeah, that was like three years earlier before it went public and they redeploy that cash. Like that is actually an IRR smart move. Yeah. This is another like chronically mismarketed, probably on purpose thing in venture, which is that people think about stuff in terms of X's. Um, but if you have a 5X fund, over 500 years, that is a horrific IRR. Yep. Um, if you have a 5X fund over two years, that is bananas. Uh, and people don't really make the distinction in those. They just say, I was part of a 3X fund or something. And time to DPI is so, so important for IRR. And that's where people should be a lot more focused on than just like the raw return multiple. Yeah, no, it's... So yeah, like this... So so going back to why... So, so why, why start Plural? 
And actually then even more of that question, right? So you're, you're in Harmonic, it's going well. You're building this Bloomberg for VCs, great, amazing investors as well. Why, why leave it and go start plural? And then I want to really dive into like what you've seen that make for great entrepreneurs with all this data that you have. Yeah. Yeah. So the answer to why uh, leave Harmonic is complicated. So I'm a, I'm a exec chair there. I'm on the board, but I'm just not, I'm just not operational. It's a complicated question. Some of the reasons have to do with me like sucking as a manager of a larger company and not loving it in a way that made me like really want to challenge myself to get better. So something that really attracted me to Plural is that I knew it was the type of company that could hit like a pretty big scale without being operationally heavy and thus requiring like a pretty big team. So that was like a pretty big delta I didn't how, hold on. I'm going to ask you around that. Like, how did, how did you come to that conclusion? I think for a lot of founders, it's really difficult. If you have a company that's growing a lot, it's hitting these yeah. metrics. There's sort of a, an individual high that you get from that, right? Like, that's why I built this company. I want to become big. I want to get, be famous. Like I want to, all these other things. Yeah. It's really mature. I think to come, like, to do a lot of executive coaching. Like, how do you come to the conclusion? Like, you know what? I don't enjoy the operational side. Like, that's not my thing. I'm not good at yeah. it. How do you even accept that individually to say that's, I'm just not good at it. That's tough, right? Um, you're someone who obviously has done really well throughout life, right? You're getting into these great schools, you're doing all these things. So to, to say, you know what? There's actually something I'm not good at. Yeah. And make that switch is tough. Yeah. I think maybe the defense mechanism of saying I don't want to be that good at it helps. <laughs> maybe that's completely like just my ego protecting me. But I think the thing that made it incredibly easy is I had a... Our first employee that came onto Harmonic ended up just being like an unbelievable powerhouse of a human. And quickly it made sense for them to be COO. And I had someone that I could look to that was just obviously world-class at operations and managing people and a bunch of stuff. And so not only did I like not have to learn as directly about my shortcomings by only having one way of hearing about it from like negative feedback or something by impacting people. But I just had this like really positive example of someone that was incredible at it. And I was like, why am I like standing in the way of that? So we had like a phenomenal relationship. It made sense for him to take over the reins. And I was really passionate about working on a bunch of other problems. And I don't think that I needed to like, if I wasn't going to be playing some of the like CEO role stuff that I thought it made sense for him to do, if he was going to take over the operational side of it, then it probably also didn't make sense for me to stay as directly like involved in the business. I wanted it to be basically like as close to his to run freely as possible with my like guidance. How do you work that out then when, when you find those people on your team and, and are able to make that decision? How do you work out the, the, the equity compensation issues, right? If someone's that good, he or she could maybe go. Is this Max in your team? I remember looking at your your team list. Yeah, was, Max. Yeah, yeah. It was was like he he sounds obviously incredibly qualified. He probably could go do his own company. So how do you convince someone like that to say, hey, you know what, like stay here, become CEO? I do real yeah. things for you, but you know your upside's also a little bit capped. Yeah, yeah. I think some of it's just luck of having found someone insanely talented who could do their own thing and just like hadn't done it. And so he joined the company, became obsessed with it. And I think like discovered how talent, in some ways discovered how good he was yeah. through the process of, of being challenged in a way, or in, in a unique way uh, for the first time. So he was at Google. I think he had like an incredible life. He was like a world jujitsu champion uh, on the side. So he's the kind of guy that just like whatever he's focusing on. And so Google was like a way for him to have a lot of extracurricular time to be obsessed about something else. And he brought that like passion and obsession to Harmonic and it was a sight to behold. So a bit of luck. And then we were just disciplined in how we raised money. So we didn't raise a lot of money until much later on in the journey. And so... I just owned a lot of the company. I owned like 65, 70% of it at the time that I left. And so I like gave up a bunch of the company so that Max was in a situation that was more like a founder. And I felt like I was in a fortunate position to be able to do that because we had raised that really good value. We just hadn't given up very much of the company. So we'd raise it. We raised small. We were pretty profitable from the beginning. We hit a million ARR like our first year. And so money was always like a way to do a little bit of de-risking and increase optionality. And also like our customers were VCs. So they were always like really excited to be involved in a, in a, like, in a game way. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah. And so I tried to actually correct that. I, I do think incentives really matter. And if you want someone to really throw their all into it, like a founder, then they have to be incentivized like one. And I was just fortunate to be able to like actually uh, put him in that situation. That's amazing. Do you think thinking through your experience just at Harmonic, but maybe also all the companies you've now looked, all the data of all the companies you've looked at, what is the, how much does recruiting and recruiting a good team play into that? Like obviously did with Max, but was it, was it luck? You're just like, I randomly met Max on the street in Palo Alto and he seems like a good guy and you bring him on board. Like, was it just total luck that way? Like what, you know, or you're actually a great recruiter and you don't, maybe you're just, you're, you're too shy to admit it. No, I'm not a great recruiter. It was complete luck with Max and it solidified for me how much I wanted to be on a really small team of really high performers instead of having to deal with the realities of scaling a company, which is that you can't be like, even if you're only picking A players, you can't be like so picky that you're only picking A++ players. And having like worked with an A++ player convinced me that I didn't want to go the traditional route so that I could like do that again. Makes sense. And what have you seen with other companies, right? So when you look through all the data that you guys have at Harmonic and even stuff that you're probably looking at to some extent with Plural, yeah, you should try to even decide, of course, which, which, which companies you'll let into the Plural fund. Are there signals that you found are really strong indicators of, in a sense, the best entrepreneurs, but maybe a better way of putting that is like the best companies, which is largely about that founder, entrepreneur, and the team they're building? Yeah. Yeah. So... I guess I have more opinions about early stage entrepreneurs than late stage entrepreneurs. And I do think it's just completely different skill sets and the best kind of evolve along the way, but it's also totally fine if you don't do that. What percent uh, do you think, are, are, do you have any numbers around what percent actually are able to evolve and grow that? Or maybe many, or, or are there plenty out there who don't evolve and grow, but they stick with it and they force themselves to stick around that whole time and they're not actually good anymore because like the ego of it or, or whatever. Yeah. I think there are a lot of companies that hit 50 people and then stop growing. And there's a correlation causation thing where like, you know, if you're on your way past 50, you have to hit 50 along the way. So obviously there are going to be way more companies that then don't end up getting past it. And it's just like the natural expansion size of the, of the startup. But so I think you would see evidence for that in there being a lot of companies that kind of scaled quickly to a certain level and then petered out. Sometimes that's a market saturation indicator. Sometimes it's a competitive thing. But I think a lot of times it's a like the founders just don't layer in people that have the skill sets to scale. And then I think great founders take on two forms in terms of being like multi-stage. They either are like an Emmett Shear at Twitch or who I like to listen to and just seems to have like an incredible capacity for learning really rapidly. And then I think there are a second set that have an incredible capacity for identifying their weaknesses and like hiring people or bringing on a team around them that complements those weaknesses. And so then how do how does that play into are there data points that you guys you look at or you've seen that you can actually start seeing like, hey, this is this is that sort of founder who has those abilities and skills? Cause I don't know, I'm sure every founder listening to this is probably thinking, well, I'm I'm one of those great entrepreneurs who has those abilities like Emmett, you know, I hope I can build the next Twitch. Yeah. But it's probably not true. Yeah. I'll speak to early stage because I don't have as much as much insight on how you would see this. But I think I think there, is, there are some weird, and I'll talk about maybe the non-obvious ones because the, the obvious ones are no fun. So I think one of the things that I try to look for in terms of data, and there, there's a, I'll caveat this by saying like so much is just, you should just actually talk to people and figure out what the hell's going on and <laughs> like how their mind works. But if you couldn't have a conversation with someone, I would focus on stuff that they're doing that is like really low status and low signal or, or not low signal, low, low status and not fun that they're doing anyway, that is correlated with entrepreneurship. Okay. So like, there, yeah, examples. Yeah. So like, seems like people that were just super into video games when it was kind of like, not, it was not cool. And this really nerdy thing. And, and then we're just really good in that competitive environment seem to like turn out to be pretty decent entrepreneurs. And YC was like a joke. And if you look at the pictures of like Sam Altman and Alexis Sohanian and stuff in those first batches, it's like these weirdos. And now it's like, I'm applying to Harvard. I hope I get in. But I think the reason why they had so many hits at the beginning is because it was like a bug light for a weirdo. 
that were hyper competitive and really competent. So like gaming seems to show that, but, but below status things. And then the second something flips to high status, so to the extent that YC has become a bad signal is it's flipped to a high status thing. Teal Fellowship is this like, it's very uncool to be into like Trump supporting libertarian, <laughs> whatever, as a 19 year old, particularly as a 19 year old, when you're like eligible for these fellowships. And so someone that would care, like, care about a teal fellowship despite that i think is a really interesting person even if you don't share teal's politics it means you're willing to like be associated with something that is going to like some have someone like it's going to give someone the ick at a like a party if you tell them and when i think you're, when you're somebody who doesn't care clearly about that you're like actually willing to have a debate. Yeah. exactly yeah, yeah yeah i think those are and then so so things that seem to have been correlated with like companies that don't end up doing well like director of product at big company and like and like ladder climbed all the way up there in that big company um if you have any tolerance for that it is like it, it's not a red flag it, but it's a it's a it's a yellow flag so the type of things that i think became really pedigreed and interesting to look for particularly during this like zerp era of all these people rolling off their like head of whatever at, at google or meta i don't i i that that's that's a really big caution signal for me and i'm looking for the people that are doing like weird low status stuff but that is also like indicative of a lot of intelligence and grit or correlated with com com competitiveness or something like that and and why do you think i mean we talked about this a little bit briefly right before we started are there certain signals that or things where you're like hey like maybe maybe you shouldn't be an entrepreneur or like don't don't go into it because i think also entrepreneurship or being sort of tech entrepreneurship right sort of venture backed entrepreneurship i should say over the past few years has also become this sort of sexy thing to do. Like you don't go, you, you go to all the best schools in the world. And, and instead of going to consulting and banking, which is what everyone used to do, yeah. you now go become, you go start your company and like that yeah. thing. And as someone who's been in this ecosystem 13 years now, I think that's like utterly hilarious. And I'm like, you're, you're going to wash out. You're going to be here three years, wash out and then go back to like the same path you were originally probably should have been on. But I mean, yeah. what are, what are things you've seen on that front too? Or were you like, Hey, like this is just, you maybe shouldn't do this. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't, I would say there's a difference between like, you shouldn't do this. And I don't think you're going to succeed at doing this. Are there, are they not correlated? Like if you're not going to succeed, maybe you shouldn't, shouldn't do it in the first place. Like don't, don't take that jump just because it's the cool thing. Like Israeli has, Israel has this like mandatory military service. And I don't think a lot of people like it, but I think it's like a, f a really formative experience for them that like shapes their worldview. And so if you like try to go into entrepreneurship and get your ass kicked and you are forever like, I don't know, humbled or like maybe politically changed. There are, but I've radically transformed in so many ways because of stuff that I've only learned because of how hard it is to start a company. And I wish more people were tuned into a lot of this stuff. And I think our world would be a better place if more people were tuned into it. So because someone isn't going to be successful, I wouldn't necessarily say like they shouldn't go into entrepreneurship, but if their goal is to be successful, which most people are, then yeah, you can kind of shortcut and say like, I don't think it's going to work out. Well, it depends on your definition of success, most likely. Yeah. In that case too. Yeah. But no, I don't, I basically, I don't think that they're like really taking much away from, they're, they're taking some recruits away. Like it got pretty ridiculous to, to find talented people during COVID. And I think that these periods of consolidation are really great are really healthy for startups because talented people aren't good aren't vcs so they'll just join companies and then it's really hard to actually build a talented team if you're the entrepreneur working on the sort of right thing in your sector and so i think these periods of consolidations are are, are really good and healthy for the ecosystem but other than that i think if you're like trying to start a company you're not really like you're not really like harming anyone so you should go and do it even if you're even if you're not going to succeed that's fair <laughs> no it, it's a great it's a great way of putting it. i mean i i wish more of the people, I mean, I remember a lot of people I, I worked with. So I, I went to Twitter and worked there for a year. And part of why I was brought into Twitter by some of the people who were there, senior people, it's like, hey, they wanted someone with a bit more of an entrepreneurial mindset. But then yeah. when, I, when I arrived, it turned out most of the people kind of rejected that mindset in a lot of ways. And it was a really tough scenario because they'd, they'd been there for 10 years. They sort of yeah. climbed the ladder, doing mm -hmm. cool things. Like Twitter was a cool place to work. You know, they hadn't really pushed themselves or actually, frankly, done all that much innovative in that yeah. time frame. And and then it was fascinating to see like, hey, look, you, how could you guys handle it in the, in the kind of the real entrepreneurial world? Can, can you get yeah. out there and deal with it? And I'm not sure a lot of them could. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think it's really hard. I think almost all people aren't cut out for it. And 
a sign that you are cut out for it is you're like having a lot of fun, even though it's really stressful and you're, you might have sleepless nights or you might like be hanging out with friends, but actually be super distant because uh, you're spending a bunch of time thinking about this like problem that's ailing you. And then you hate that fact, but you wouldn't actually trade it for anything because the contrast between it and like the contrast between it and even lecturing at, at Stanford, which I think is like a pretty, it's like pretty, it's a pretty high watermark in terms of creativity and like having a lot of control over your life and, and not being a, a drone or whatever in your job. It is like the level of intellectual stimulation and fun and like adrenaline and just feeling like you've changed enormously and learned a lot and progressed as like a human in this world. I, I get like, I get that amount of progress in like a week of entrepreneurship as I did in like a year of trying to trying to teach. And, and actually it's funny to, to contrast it with the venture capital world to some extent where it takes 10 years to see if things work. In a startup, yeah. you see it right away. I mean, like something very similar mm -hmm. for me and my company. Look, I, and actually uh, funny, all the stuff you just described is exactly how I feel like, man, this is so <laughs> stressful. It is tiring. It is tough. But I would rather, there's nothing else I'd rather be doing because yeah. Yeah, I'm learning every single day. So I mean, we made yeah. a really big change internally at, at Levy. And it was tough. I spent a lot of time doing it. And frankly, it, I still think it's the right decision. It didn't get quite as positive a response as I wanted. But yeah. that's also learning too. Like, how do I make sure people really understand these pieces? Why I'm making this change? Why the effort was put in? What this leads to as a company? And continuously reinventing ourselves and learning, at least for yeah. me, is, is having that mindset to some extent. Like, I just want to keep learning every day. And yeah. that's the upside. And if it turns out, it makes a ton of money because we built something really, really valuable. For all of our customers, huge win. Yeah, but that's yeah. you know I'm I'm doing it I'm doing it to make a, a big dent in the world and learn and yeah outside of it yeah has a big difference too. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Uh, during the harmonic transition, I was fortunate enough to sort of be in a situation where I didn't really have to like work post that, and it took me like three weeks to just be bored and want to start on new stuff. And I think some people in the entrepreneurial community will like say that that's depressing or like they need to find meaning elsewhere or whatever, but it wasn't depressing at all to me. I, I was like, oh shit, this is like actually just super fun and it's what I like doing. And instead of fighting that uh, or thinking that I need to be like relaxing or something, uh, I'm just gonna like go where the world takes me. But I think founders need to, tell me, tell me if you agree, like founders need to recognize and, and accept that their, their main focus when you're starting a company, you should not start a company unless you are willing to be incredibly focused on that company. Like you can't do it and be like, well, I have like five different things outside of work. I mean, I, at least for me, I believe like I, I have two things. It's my company and my job and my family. Yeah. And yeah, I don't have time for like TV. I barely have time. To, I, I read as much as I can because I love reading, but like I basically don't have time for a lot of other stuff. Like I don't have as much time for friends and do all that. Yeah. And that just, that's a personal life decision that I've made, but yeah. you have to be willing to make that it. sacrifice. Yeah. Some people pull it off. But I would say it's definitely correlated with like me seeing that you're you're gonna go back into your old corporate job six months later. <laughs> so then going going back to the late stage stuff, and then I'll I'll come back to where we've kind of started, which is like, do you think that I don't know if you I know you've looked as, as many as sort of late stage ones, but in plural, you kind of are looking at later stage founders in companies. Yeah. Are those entrepreneurs that you that are they just as happy from the earliest days, the ones who stuck around to where they are at the end? Like, there's different stressors that are still occurring. Maybe they're still learning. Are there things you've taken away? I mean, if you were, you decided to kind of get out of that to some extent, but like, are there lessons learned as you get later stage, like how to balance your life out and do things differently? Yeah, I do think it is less hard at later stages. And some people find a way to just keep the treadmill going. But I think the first year of starting a company is just so, so hard. You are like really pushing a boulder up a hill. And if you stop for a second, it's just going down the hill. And in order for that to then be sustainable at later stages, I think you have to build a team around you that's more talented than you in a bunch of stuff. And you become the like synthesizer <laughs> of those different things or the like orchestra person with the wand. I don't know what they're called. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Conductor, uh, conductor, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, good to show how often you and I have both been to the orchestra. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's my, that's, that's my observation. Again, I, 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 Having built a thousand person company, I don't, I don't really have a ton of insight into those folks, but my observation is that things really do get easier at like 50 people. And, and so you need to shift your focus from doing all the boulder pushing yourself to like building a team around you. And the people that stay in it for the long haul and don't get burned out and leave seem to have successfully found like really incredible right hand, right hand folks. Yeah. That's, 
that's what I've I've seen for the companies that I built to that size. And what I'm seeing right now with Levy is sort of the same thing. Is it's slowly, so we're about 27, 28 people right now. And we're slowly yeah. starting to get to that stage and I have a little bit more time for other things and I don't have to do every single job myself. And I'm continuously trying to hire and train yeah. other people who want to take on that mindset and have some of that ownership perspective, but yeah. you know, a long way to go. So I want to go back to kind of where we, where we started to some extent and say, okay, it, and I love that you said like your family was, uh, you know, anti-capitalist, right? You didn't, you didn't say anything else, but so call it that like anti-capitalist, right? What does your family think of where you've gone to and what you've done nowadays, right? You, you've made life-changing money. You've built some great companies. You I'm sure many more to build still, but plural is just getting started. How did, how is that all, what does that look like at the Thanksgiving d- dinner table with your family when you guys chat through, you know, what's Brian up to? Yeah. I think they understand that my a, intentions are still in the same place. Meaning like if you're anti-capitalist because you're skeptical of capitalism's impact on like poor people or, you know, choose whatever reason you're against something. If you're still pro like trying to help poor people at, as like mo- in the most effective way possible and you just try to like come at it from a different perspective, then it makes the conversation easier. It's definitely like we get into some weird stuff and I look like this complete like mirror image <laughs> of myself when I was younger, but at least like... I like to convince myself that I'm trying to pursue the same goals that my younger self cared about. And I've just like realized that the world actually works in an inverted way sometimes. And the things that I was skeptical of are actually the better way to get toward those goals. I haven't like rejected the goals. So I've been, I like to think that I've been pretty consistent on those things and it makes the Thanksgiving conversation easier. <laughs> I, I would imagine in to me, to me, look, obviously I'm, I'm someone who would agree with that whole thesis in a lot of ways. Like I think the power of technology, it's certainly not perfect. It certainly has lots of unintended consequences in many situations, but capitalism overall and technology itself and the, the world we're in has has led to the the world in many ways being the greatest, it's the greatest time to be alive in yeah. many cases right now. And that that's not perfect. So it's not perfect. It can be better, but man, there's a lot of cool stuff happening that's making the world better every day. So before we wrap up, how can people get in touch with you if they're curious about plural, curious about harmonic? How can people find you? You're you're sort of barely on LinkedIn. You're barely on social media. So so how can how how can people get in touch? If they want to learn more. Just talk with you about the stuff that you know probably better than anyone else. Yeah, you can shoot me an email at Brian spelled with a Y B R Y A N at withplural.com. And if you want to be especially adventurous, I have a Twitter account Brian Casey uh, with two Y's. But I never post on it. I just stalk other people on Twitter. Uh, but you can DM me there. Yeah. Amazing. And actually, I realized I have one last question, which I asked everybody, and I almost forgot it. Um, so I can't leave, leave without it. If there's one single piece of advice that you'd give to every entrepreneur, what would that one piece of advice be? You'd say, like, do, do this, and you have a higher chance at a great outcome and success. A higher chance at a great outcome? Like, viciously try to make a product that doesn't work. So do the opposite of what you think. Come up for it. Come up. You should be trying to prove that your product is not going to work and thinking of all the ways that your product isn't going to work and testing those as early as possible in the process. And then if you can't really prove that it's not going to work, then you are closer to like actually finding a product market fit. So what I tell people to do is to lean in as hard as possible to the areas where they're not like doing well with the customer interviews or they're finding people fall off or any negative signal. Like you have to, you have to show that that's not going to be something that kills your company. Otherwise you're just wasting your time and you should be trying to get to a no as quickly as possible instead of like trying to slowly get to a yes. And then, and a year and a half later, you end up in no territory. Fantastic advice, Brian. Thank (laughs) you so, so much. I really appreciate having you on. This was fun to do. Thank you. And I look forward to continuing to work with you in a bunch of different ways. Amazing. Thanks so much, Adam. (laughs) 